Lord, it is good to be here. Please be seated. The obvious thing this morning is to speak about the mountaintop experience and to explain it is actually in the valley that we grow or in the valley that we work. The thing is, you know that and we'll get to that eventually. You see, we have this morning something very important, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ and this is a part of the journey. The journey of doing his father's will, our father's will. And his journey to Jerusalem, which leads us up this mountain top to experience God. And many a believer can tell you of this experience, but even more, hope that they will all get to experience God on the mountain top in some dramatic thunder and lightning effect. I can tell you too about my mountain top experience. I can tell you about walking in the valley. I can tell you about drudging through the gutter. But some Christians spend their whole life wishing for this dramatic experience of God. And the end result is disappointment. Dramatic encounters of God are rare. Even for saints such as Peter. You see, these flashes of God's glory are incredibly rare, both for ordinary and extraordinary Christians. And I made the distinguishment or the distinguishing factor there. You see, we like to say that we're all equal. If you believe that, then you have to ask yourself, on what level are we equal? Do you consider yourself as equal to me? Why well, bigger than most of you here? <laughs> but do you consider, on what level are we really equal? Because if you're going to speak about education, then we know that that is not true because some schools are better than some. We like to tell our children lies. Some are better than some. If we're going to speak about job opportunities or workplaces, the reality is some are better than some. And what you get at the end after working for some people is way better than others. So on what level are we really equal? You see, this all comes down to God and how God sees us and more so what it is that we're called to. You see, Jesus had 12 companions. 12 that he himself chose. Nobody didn't beg for their friend to get a little pick with Jesus. Jesus picked these 12 men himself. He chose who he wanted. But he only carried three up the mountain. Now that says something to me. Because he took the very mouthy Peter. The same Peter that said, Lord, if you bid me come. No, Lord, if it is you, bid me come. And we know what happened. Peter eased out of the boat, take a few steps, and he sank. This is the same Peter that we told chopped off a man's ear to show serious he was about protecting Jesus. But when the reality of this epic event sunk in, we had the background music of the cock crowing and Peter saying, nope, not me, don't know the man. It wasn't me. But that same Peter said, you are the Christ. That means something. Jesus also took with him the very ambitious James and John, sons of, sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. Some say the mother asked, some say the boys asked. But whoever asked, they understood something was going on. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, you want to be seated one at your left and one at your right. Even if they got it wrong, they understood something was up. But well, what about the others? Just like the church today, those first followers were at a different point in their spiritual journey. Can you imagine Thomas up on the mountain of transfiguration? Or Judas? Jesus knew who to take. 
Because I can see Thomas and Judas now. Thomas want to get all touchy feely and not believing, and Judas probably looking to take a shortcut. You see, we are all at different stages in our journey. Jesus took the three who, in my opinion, were further along in their spiritual journey. There are some gathered right now, just like we are, who have been doing that for eons, who have not made any significant stride in their own spiritual journey. Actually, if they were to look back, they could probably see the starting line right there. Not to be offended, or to be offensive rather, that is just how it is. There is a verse in the hymn we sing. There are blessings you cannot receive till you know him in his fullness and believe. You're the one to profit when you say, I'm going to walk with Jesus all the way. You see, we are called not just to put in an appearance and expect a miracle. Not that it can happen because it can, but we are called to put something in. Faith is required. I don't think each story of transfiguration is there to tell us we can all have a mountaintop experience of God. I think it is there to reveal to us who Jesus really is. It feels like if Jesus gives Peter and James and John a backstage pass, they get to see what is going on behind the scenes. Maybe we too can peek behind the curtain ourselves. But you see, some of the circumstances of this story reflect the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, where again, heavy with sleep, they drift off into their nocturnal bliss, ignorant to the showdown that is about to unfold. You see, to me, this says something about the disciples' inability to comprehend Jesus. On the mountaintop, the divinity of Christ is revealed to them. They're woken up by the flashing light, the words used to describe Jesus. That's an appearance, it's the same word used to describe lightning. The disciples are woken up out of their ignorance, they're sleeping to the light of Christ. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the divinity of Jesus Christ is fully revealed to them. They are woken up by Jesus to see his continuing journey to his death. The fact that they are asleep on both occasions is a clear indication that they have difficulty comprehending who Jesus really is. Who God the Father really is. Who the Son is who the Holy Spirit is. Despite coming face to face with him, they miss the Trinitarian mystery, which is at the heart of our faith. But this is not an indictment on them because we too find ourselves in this position where we see God, but we don't know his God. Because many of us spend our time hoping for tongues of fire and a rushing mighty wind. I too would like tongues of fire wagging over people's head on a rushing mighty wind. I'm sure it would make me a better priest, a better husband, a better father, but everything. But it doesn't happen like that. Because we miss God. We miss God because we're looking for something that is not there. When in actual fact, God presents himself to us over and over, constantly. You see, the story of the talents, that comes to mind. Where one got five, we're told the other got three, and one got one. And we often scoff at the man that got one. Because the chap with five, he went out and multiplied it by five. The chap with three, multiplied his by three. But to me, the church is that individual with the one. Where we have a gift, we've been given a gift, but do we use it? You can answer. Do we use our gifts? Sometimes. That sounds about it. What are we doing the rest of the time? Complaining. Griping and belly aching and longing after something that belongs to somebody else. We say, almost daily, we'll say today, give us this day our daily bread. And God continues to give us daily our bread. Not just food, but clothing and shelter, safe travel, 
sustenance for the day. But are we thankful for what God gives? We're not thankful because nothing wrong with your car. But Mr. Jones changed your car. So you gotta change your car too. The paint the house on these new flashy colors. So we gotta paint our house too. I'll tell you a little story about me again. You get a little bit more the priest business again. When I was about 12, my father's name is David Jones. My grandmother's Meryl Jones. But I lived at Telma Boyne. And uh, I can't remember what it is I asked for. But it was because one of my cousins had this thing. And she said to me, Y'all always looking to keep up with the Joneses. And me, in my wisdom, said to my grandmother, I don't have to keep up with the Joneses. I am a Jones. <laughs> that was met with a swift back slap. And my mouth ended up bleeding. God doesn't give us a back slap. The thing is, God provides for us but we ignore what God has given us. Because day after day, we have what is for us. But we want something more. And the thing is, remember the man with the one talent, what happened to it? It was taken away. Because he didn't use it. God gives us talents to use, and not just use, but to use for his honor and his glory. If we don't use our talents, we will lose our talents. But the thing is, we don't see God in these little things. We need something big and magnificent. We too miss God. Time and time again, we miss it because we want a miracle. I will tell you this. Y'all know anything about sleep? Sleep, yes, yeah, sleep. S-L-E-E-P. You gotta talk to me. What happens between when you intentionally go to sleep or if you accidentally drift off to sleep and waking up? What happens in between there? We don't know. You dream. <laughs> I guess so. But the thing is, we don't know what happens in between there, but we get up. We can give no account for what happened between when we closed our eyes last night or early this morning and when we woke up. Isn't sleep then a miracle? Because keeping it simple, we go back to things we used to say. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord. Y'all you don't know this prayer. If I should die before I wait. So we have committed ourselves into the hands of God. Now consider this. Think of all the things that you did yesterday that you should not have done. That could fall into the bracket of sin. Don't tell me. Keep it to yourself. Consider this. The wages of sin is death. You think you should have got up this morning? But God, with all of the love that he has, work a miracle. Sleep in itself is a miracle. But we don't, we don't consider these things. The conception of a child, the birth of a child, aren't these things miracles? But you see, we are so desensitized to all of these things. They're just ordinary things. Raising children, being loving, doing, doing the things that parents do. I was walking this way and I saw a young lady with a child in the mother hole, like this. The grip that only a mother masters to comb your hair, to keep you from moving and that sort of stuff. And I smile because These are things that, I don't know, they speak to me. They bring memories and that sort of stuff. And the thing is, this is where we find God. 
but we just want this big something to happen and the end result of persons waiting for this mountain top experience usually is disappointment not because God is not there not because it cannot happen but because we fail to see God we fail to see God first in ourselves and then we fail to see God in others we fail to see God in the workings around us because we are waiting for this big thing to happen I will tell you this the beginning of the big thing is you because if we understand that God is a part of us and that we can do something and not just understanding that but doing it because this is where I get lost with Christianity we come we learn and then what happened you forget I feel so We gather in, there are persons just like us gathered in houses just like this. Houses of prayer just like this. And they will sing just as sweet as you sang and they will pray and they will do all of these things. But then what happens? At the end of all that we do, there will be a prayer. Those upon whom your spirit shines give light to the world. Are we doing that? Because that is what God has called us to. It is okay to come to church, but then what? What happens when we leave church? We can eat, we can sleep, and then what? We come into this house for a purpose. And when we leave, that is when we are supposed to achieve this purpose. If we are not going to let the light of Christ shine, it doesn't make any sense coming. Because we come with persons just like ourselves. If I were to take this entire congregation and put you on Broad Street right now, do you think people will see the light of Christ? Say yes, make me feel good. Yes. Because we have that light within us, but we don't allow it to shine. Because we confuse ourselves with so many other things rather than the light that is there. If we accept what God has given us, we will use it when we use it people will see God because we are satisfied with what we have when you are satisfied with what you have believe it or not that is encouragement for somebody else somebody else that might not have as much as you have but you use it to the best of your ability and when we all allow our light to shine it moves from a little light to a blinding light and consider that the world we live in, we speak about how dark the world is. I'm pointing the fingers, but if we are the light of Christ and the world dark, you figure it out. We got some problems. Because we are the ones called to take Christ into the world. And we sing some wonderful things. God has no hands but our hands. He has no feet but our feet. But we're sitting down with our hands full, doing nothing. God is calling all of us to something. You see, Jesus took these three men up on the mountain to reveal to them who he really was. We don't have to go up a mountain to understand who God is because God continues to work in our lives daily. I don't think there's none among us who can say they don't believe in God. Because God continues to do things. How many of us did not have but received? How many of us did not know where was coming from but God? It is not fate, it is not luck, it is God. But you see, we discount God for all of these other things, and then we say we want a miracle. To do what? What are you going to do when you get the miracle? Chances are, the miracle might not be big enough, so we want an even bigger miracle. God is working his purpose out if the people of God get up and do his work. You see, they went up the mountain 
so they could get a glimpse as to who this God was. The beautiful thing about it is, we have with him Moses and Elijah. And Jesus went on to say, he didn't come to abolish the laws nor the prophets, but to fulfill them. And we have Moses who went up a mountain, and his face shone. But here it is, we see Jesus totally illuminated. And this is what the disciples see. We too have seen Jesus. We have seen the workings of Jesus. We know how powerful Jesus is. But we somehow fail to do what God has called us to do. We come, we claim to know, we understand, and we leave, and we do nothing. It doesn't make any sense. God has revealed himself to us in many ways. We know about the power of God. It is left therefore for us who claim to be Christian, who claim to be children of God, to allow God to shine through us. To be mirror images of who Jesus is, not was, who he is. The thing is, that is a lot easier than it sounds. Because we sometimes attach this romanticism to Christianity that I really don't think has a place there. If Christianity is about walking a life or a journey patterned after Jesus, that makes me uncomfortable. Because Jesus stood out. And it was not about popularity. It was about saying when right is right and when wrong is wrong. Are we willing to do that? Many of us are not because we want to fit in. Because we want friends. That is not Christianity. Jesus is calling us to something great. The thing is, he's not calling us alone. Because as different as we are along our Christian journey, the equalizing factor is this, God. No matter where we are, no matter what is your position, this remains. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the thing we should be doing is allowing our light to shine wherever we are, not to bring glory to ourselves, but for persons to see so they too can glorify God. That is where the equality comes in. So it's not about me and what I can do and how magnificent I am. That is not Christianity. Christianity is about allowing persons to see God in us. Christianity is about persons like yourself and myself coming together in such a way that we can light up the world and lead persons to God. You see, the light that we have within us has a purpose. We have to show people who God is. We have to lead persons to God. If we are not doing that, then we're wasting time. I don't believe in wasting any time, so I will hush for today, right here. But you see, on top of the mountain or in the valley, the same remains. If Jesus did not go up the mountain, he would have continued on the journey the same way because his journey led to Jerusalem where he died. The mountaintop experience was for the disciples to really get a glimpse as to who this Jesus is. We have a glimpse of who this Jesus is. Sunday after Sunday, we come and we kneel and we come face to face with God in the mystery of the Holy Sacrament. We understand this thing, so therefore we need to begin to do it. I will share this poem with you before I go. And I suspect some of you would have heard it before. 
but it was recommended to me and I will share it with you. Sometimes life seems hard to bear, full of sour, sour trouble and woe. It's then that we remember that it is in the valleys that we grow. If we always stayed on the mountain top and never experienced pain, we would never appreciate God's love and would be living in vain. We have so much to learn and our growth is very slow. Sometimes we need a mountain top, but it is in the valleys that we grow. We do not always understand why things happen as they do, but I am very sure of one thing, my Lord will see us through. The little valleys are nothing. When we picture Christ on the cross, he went through the valley of death. His victory was Satan's loss. Forgive me, Lord, for complaining when I'm feeling so very low. Just give me a gentle reminder that it is in the valleys we grow. Continue to strengthen me, Lord, and use my life each day to share your love with others and help them on their way. Thank you for the valleys, Lord, for this one thing I know. The mountain tops are glorious, but it's in the valleys that we grow. We have been strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Christ resides in all of us. We are called to use that, to show that, to be that. Amen.